All right, this is Modern Physics, uh, Regents Physics review video. Just review. I'm going to go pretty quick. Here we go. Uh, gonna, the top half kind of all goes together in this, uh, the standard model I'm going to do separately. So the first bit of uh, modern physics we got to talk about is atomic models, the, the basically the history of the atom. Uh, whilst this might not uh, find itself directly in the Regents curriculum, uh, you should be very aware of these first two points. Now, of course, all of this definitely is in the curriculum. So, first bit you got to check out is the Thompson model. J.G. Thompson was the dude that uh, created the plum pudding model. Uh, and, and more or less, what he was able to show or tried to show was that uh, the atom actually has stuff inside of it. So, he, he assumed, and this was incorrect, but it got the ball rolling. He assumed that the atom was mostly positive material with a negative charge embedded into it. So he envisioned it as plum pudding, which is more like a chocolate chip cookie dough. And the embedded plums would be the negative charge, and the actual pudding itself would be the positive charge. He wasn't completely correct. This was based off of his work with the cathode ray experiment, which more or less is attributed to the discovery of the electron. Then you've got Ernest Rutherford, who came in and tried to prove a Thomson's model correct or incorrect. And um, what he did is he uh, did the gold foil experiment. In his gold foil experiment, he shot alpha particles at gold foil, expected all of them to go straight through unimpeded, and it turned out that they were being uh, more or less affected by the gold foil more than he was expecting. In fact, some of them curved all the way around, bent right back towards him. Very surprising. And from this, he was able to conclude a more accurate model of the atom, that the atom is mostly empty space, and all of its positive charge and most of its mass is located in its nucleus. And from this model, he created the planetary model of the atom, which also wasn't completely correct, but more accurate. And he said that the atom has this positive nucleus and that the electrons orbit the nucleus, which is often how we envision the model of the atom, but it's not accurate. So then came Niels Bohr. He was the first one that discussed this idea of quantized energy. And so Niels, said, Niels Bohr says that electrons require specific amounts of energy and exist in specific energy levels. So he basically took this planetary model, and instead of calling it orbits, he called it energy levels, and he talked about how electrons can jump from one level to the other. The Bohr model is a pretty big component of physics. And it's this idea that, um, if I'm gonna try to, I'm going to try to draw that orbit planetary model again, but it's not quite the same thing as Rutherford's model. I'm going to give just three energy levels. They look like these orbits. These are my energy levels. What Bohr says is electrons want to exist in the lowest energy level they can fit in. But then he also says that photons carrying a certain amount of energy can come in, hit these electrons. The electron if it absorbs the exact right amount of energy, can jump to an energy level or even to a second energy level. And then once it's out here, it will fall back down to those energy levels, re-emitting the same amount of energy. What's important to know here is it needs to be the exact amount of energy. So if we know a specific amount of energy to go from 1 to 2, if we have more or even less than that, nothing will happen. Unless, of course, it's enough to get it to the next level the exact amount of energy. This is mostly right, but it turns out that the true model is called the electron cloud model. Instead of it being regions of space, or I'm sorry, instead of it being energy levels, we think of these as regions of space. We think of these as zones uh, where we have a more probable location for electrons, but this model actually allows electrons to exist in all the areas, just most likely these energy levels that Bohr talked about. To really describe the Bohr model, we got to look at the modern physics section of our reference tables, this top part, the energy level diagrams. This is more or less what I just showed you, but in a two-dimensional ladder type of view, with this being the ground state, this being, or so that's the lowest energy level. Think of this as that first ring I drew. This is the second energy level, third, all the way down uh, until we leave, which is considered ionization. So an electron that's in the ground state needs 13.6, if you look up here, electron volts, to jump from the ground state to leave the atom. That's known as ionization. So if a photon comes in carrying 13.6 EV of, elect of energy, the electron will absorb it and it'll leave the atom. But if it's less than 13.6 EV, 
it could jump to another energy level so long as whatever it is absorbing is exactly the right amount. So let's look at energy level 1 and 2. You see here that to go from 1 is 13.6 to 2 being 3.4, this, elect this um, electron needs to absorb 10.2 EV of energy. So if a photon comes in carrying 10.2 EV of energy, it will jump to level 2. But if it's carrying only 10.1 EV or 10.3 EV, nothing will happen. The electron will just stay in the ground state as if nothing took place. It's got to be the exact amount. And it can go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. It can go 1 right to 4. And it can drop 4 down to 1, 4 to 3 to 2 to 1. Any of these levels, any of these possibilities. So if it goes from level 3 to level 2 to level 1, then it will emit two photons on its journey back down. It will emit a photon going from 3 to 2, and then it will emit a photon going from 2 to 1. That does bring up the other side of this, which is how do we associate and know how much energy a photon carries. And this is where uh, Einstein's work comes into play via his photoelectric effect, which is limited in its context in regions physics. However, this one concept that comes out of it, this equation, is very much in our curriculum. And what Einstein said was uh, photons themselves are like little particles and that just carry no mass. So a light ray is better described from Einstein's viewpoint as a particle that carries energy. And that energy is associated with its frequency. So this equation, E equals HF, which equals HC over lambda, is what we'll use to determine the energy of a photon. This is Einstein saying that there's a particle concept of light that we need to look at. In reality, there was a fight, a big war in the late 1800s, 1900s, and, and many years prior and many years after, uh, in which we're trying to describe what is light. And ultimately, the new or the most current definition of light is this wave-particle duality. And what it shows is that light can behave as a wave, but it can also behave as a particle. And ultimately, if you go far enough down the line, we are able to show that light is really a particle that travels in a wave-like manner. It gets a little monkey. I'm not going to get into too much depth here. Check out some videos that describe that a little bit more. What I'm really concerned about you understanding is how to use this equation, E equals HF, which is HC over lambda, which you can find in the modern physics section of your reference tables. And it even goes as far as to say a subscript is a photon. So this is the energy of a photon, which is HF, which is HC over lambda. F is frequency, lambda is wavelength, H is Planck's constant, which is on the front page of your tables, and C is the speed of light, which is also a constant, also on the front page of your tables. So if we go back to this other energy level diagram, we can figure out what frequency of light is needed for an electron to go from 1 to 2, because we know how much energy is needed, and then we solve for frequency. The only thing I need to caution you on is these energies are given in electron volts. Your standard unit for energy, if you're using any equation, is actually a joule. Uh, so we need to convert our electron volts to joules. You can do that on the front page of your tables. So if you know what one electron volt is, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, you take however many EV you have and multiply this number. If you want to go the other direction, if you want to go from joules to EV, you divide by this number. And finally, Einstein is also well known for his E equals MC squared equation. This is pretty much anyone that has not taken physics, if we're to ask what equation Einstein's famous for, the gross majority will say E equals MC squared. And this is mass equivalence and it's utilized in multiple aspects of physics often described to explain the missing energy or the missing mass that comes into play when atoms are formed if you measure the mass of each particle and total it all up and you measure the mass of the atom once it's been formed you total it up the masses will be different and so mass tend seems to disappear and was known as mass defect and really it didn't disappear it converted from mass to energy and there are multiple other applications of this equation e equals mc squared is what you do need to use if you're trying to figure out how much energy is released when particles annihilate or just turn into pure energy the mass does need to be in kilograms uh, your energy unit here is indeed joules again you'll have to convert if you need electron volts also, the other point I want to make here is sometimes we give mass in its energy version also, or instead, and that's known as a universal mass unit. It seems like we're calling it a mass, but really it's an energy term. One universal mass unit is more or less the energy of one proton. It's not. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit off, but it's very, very close. A proton's a little bit more than this. You look at it, it's 9.31 times 10 to the 2 MeV. Well, EV stands for electron volts. Capital M is mega which really is a million. You see that right here, 10 to the 6, six zeros is a million. 
Uh, and then we're in scientific notation here, so it's really 931 mega electron volts, or really 931 million electron volts. So if I wanted to tell me, if I were to tell you I have a particle, let's get back to over here. Uh, if I were to say I have something that is 0 0.0018 U, and I want to know how much energy is this, don't go and plug it into E equals mc squared. It's already in an energy version. All we got to do is find out what 1u is equal to. Well, 1u is equal to 9.31 times 10 to the 2 mega electron volts. So if I have this many u, I have less than that many electron volts. Just going to take this number that we have and multiply it by the conversion factor here. And the last bit of modern physics is the standard model of particle physics. Uh, there's so much more to this than what we cover in the Regents level, and it's going to seem significantly more confusing than it needs to be. This isn't a lesson, this is a review, so I won't go on and on about it. But ultimately, what you need to do here is identify the different various values of forces in nature. Also, then identify and understand how you can figure out the different categories in which all matter is found within. So before I go on and on and on about this list, let's just look at the standard model in our reference tables, which is in the modern physics section, middle of the reference tables, the bottom half of what we just looked at, this stuff over here. If you could understand not what these things all are, but how to identify everything, you're going to be fine. A lot of you are going to want to ask, well, what is a tau lepton? Well, quite frankly, you don't need to know what it is, and I wish you did, but it's not part of this curriculum. What you do need to know is understand what a tau neutrino or tau lepton is made up of, or a tau neutrino is, and how it forms other things. So if we look at the classification of matter, we see all matter is broken down into hadrons and leptons, then hadrons are broken down into baryons and mesons, the baryons are made up of three quarks, and the mesons are made up of a quark and an antiquark. We can find what all the quarks are right up here, and all the leptons over here. I'm going to come back to this in a second. So here we go. First and foremost, know the four fundamental forces of nature. This is all of them, every single one of them. This has been known for a long time. We've got gravitation, electromagnetism. you got the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force. Gravity and electromagnetism, you know. Weak nuclear force, you barely need to know much about it. What you need to know is it's the force responsible for atomic decay, nuclear half-lives, things like this. It is found uh, at the subatomic level. It does not extend past the atom. You've got the strong nuclear force, which you definitely need to know a lot about. It is the strongest force in all of nature. That's why it's called the strong nuclear force. And it is responsible for holding the nucleus together. It's what keeps the protons and neutrons together. Without it, the protons will rip each other apart because they don't like to be near each other. So a strong nuclear force has to be stronger than the repulsive electromagnetic force between the protons. And it is. It's about 100 times stronger. So it keeps the proton intact keeps the nucleus intact. If I were to rank these in terms of strongest to weakest, we have the strong nuclear forces up top, you then have EM, you then have the weak force, and then way, 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 way down here you'd have gravity. Gravity is way weaker than the other three. Gravity is by far the, the weakest force. Um, EM and gravity are known as infinite forces. They extend infinitely far away. You never actually get to zero. Uh, the strong and nuclear, the strong and weak nuclear forces are not infinite. They only exist within the atom. In fact, the strong nuclear force only exists within the nucleus. So, a very common concept problem will say which of the following subatomic particles are not affected by the strong nuclear force. It's basically any subatomic particle not in the nucleus. In this case, it'd be the electron. Electrons are not affected by the strong. They are affected by the other three. Once we know our, we got our forces down, we're going to understand the categories of matter. Here we go. Our leptons are fundamental particles. Fundamental means nothing can be made up, nothing is inside of it. It is the smallest version of itself. Nothing else is inside a lepton. They're believed to be six of the 12 building blocks of all of nature. The only lepton that you probably are strongly familiar with is the electron. The other ones, uh, muon, tau, the neutrinos themselves, you're, you're not really going to understand what they are or how they're found in nature. You just need to understand that they're fundamental particles. They're one of the 12 possible fundamental particles. Hadrons get broken down into multiple categories. Your baryons and mesons, and then your baryons and mesons each are made up of quarks. So quarks, if you recognize here, leptons are six of the 12 fundamental particles. Quarks are the other six. We have 12 fundamental particles in all of nature. Quarks themselves will never be found alone on their own. They always come together in a trio to make a baryon or in a pair uh, to make a meson. We'll get to the anti-part in a second. 
all quirks have they have really ridiculous names up down charm strange top and bottom and they each have their own little uh, charge associated with them but again they're not found in nature the rule you got to understand about quirk combinations for both baryons and mesons is all quirks combine to make an overall charge of zero negative one or positive one elementary charge you'll never have more than that or less than that or anywhere in between so you can't get an overall plus two-thirds charge once you combine everything together uh, you do need to know, and it's not in your reference tables, you just need to know and memorize this, that protons and neutrons are indeed baryons, which means they are made up of three quarks. So let's just go through a couple examples. If we look over at our reference tables here, if I were to tell you I've got something that's made up of up, charm, and down quark combination, we would first write out that the quark combination is an up, charm, and down UCD. Then we'd indicate the charge of each. You'll see that up has an overall two-thirds charge, charm is an overall two-thirds charge, and down is negative one-third. So I'm going to write that out. I'm going to say it's plus two-thirds, plus two-thirds, and minus one-third. Do the math, it all comes together being positive one. It's not just positive one, it's positive one E, because if you look over here, each one is two-thirds E, two-thirds E, and E stands for elementary charge. So this particular particle is possible because it fits that rule of negative one, zero, and positive one. And it's made up of three quarks. Not only that we know it's possible, we also know what classification is. It must be a baryon, must be a hadron. Made up of three quarks, comes together to be positive one. That's all you gotta do for these. Just go through, make sure the fractional math works out fine. The other thing you need to know about is this anti-bit. All matter has an anti-version of itself. Anti-matter, more or less, is the same thing as the regular particle but negative in charge. The other thing you do need to know is it has opposite magnetic spin, which only comes into play conceptually. Let me give you some examples. A proton has an antiparticle called the antiproton. A proton is plus one E, has a mass that's de defined on the front page of your tables, uh, 1.67 by 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, I do believe. Uh, an antiproton will be the same mass, will act the same way as a proton, but instead of being positive one E, it's negative 1e. E. A lot of times students will say, well, isn't that an electron then? No, an electron is significantly less massive, behaves totally different than a proton. It's fundamental. It's not made up of things inside of it. Just because it's opposite of charge of a proton doesn't mean it's an antiproton. On the flip side, we have other things like a neutron, which is zero charge, and an antineutron, which is also zero charge, because how do you have opposite of zero? So what you need to know about an antineutron is that it has opposite magnetic spin. You don't really need to know what magnetic spin is, you just need to know that an anti-neutron is opposite of that. If this makes you feel uncomfortable and you want to know more, I highly encourage you to learn more. Check out standard model videos. There's a ton of them out there. I really like Hank Green's video on the standard model. It's a song. Check it out. It's pretty catchy. Uh, last thing I just want to show is how to indicate anti. So if I were to do, uh, this is a if I were to do the anti-version of this example I gave earlier here, I'd say it's an anti-up, anti-charm, anti-down. To indicate anti, I just put a bar over the top. So now it would be negative two-thirds, negative two-thirds, positive one-third, creating an overall negative one. E makes sense because it's anti, it should be opposite in charge. Everything else is the same other than it's opposite magnetic spin. All right, this is the modern physics. I know there's a lot here. You probably need to go more in depth on a lot of this to really get a firm understanding. Remember, this is just review. Uh, there is a review worksheet that goes with it. Thank you.